Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a great webinar lined up for you. Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping items um, that I want to, to mention first, and then I'm going to pass it off to uh, Monica Chen and Ali for an uh, introduction to the panelists and to start the webinar off. Um, so just first to let everyone know this is being recorded and we'll We'll make this link available afterwards if you want to review it or share it with anybody. Um, you are, your videos have been turned off and your um, microphones are muted. If you have any questions, there's a Q&A option. You can post your questions in the Q&A. And if you sent in your questions before, we'll be addressing those at the end of this um, or during this webinar. So um, hold on to those. But if you have new questions, feel free to type them in or um, we can address those at the end of the, the discussion here. Um, I think that's pretty much it. There's a couple of view options you can choose from gallery or speaker view. Speaker view um, at the top right of your screen, you should be able to see that option to change it. And if you want to change it to that view, um, you'll be able to see the screen they're sharing and the speaker who's talking if you have that option to choose. And I think that's all the housekeeping items. So I'll pass it over to um, Monica Chen, and she can introduce herself and start this thing off. Monica? Great. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. So my name is Monica Chen. I'm the executive director of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. I am calling in today from Oakland, California. And I just wanted to briefly tell everybody a little bit about FFAC. We are an organization committed to ending factory farming. We do so through three strategies. The first is raising awareness. So we are known for giving presentations. We do this at corporations, at colleges, in educational institutions, all the way down from uh, high school to kindergarten. We do a lot of outreach with tabling and leafleting, being at a lot of different events. And we do all this raising of awareness of issues related to factory farming so that we can mobilize activists. And we have a lot of interns on our call today that I hope will ask us many good questions. And our activists are folks that we are training to advocate for institutional change at their schools, at their companies, um, at their colleges. And we believe that this is integral to reducing demand for factory farmed food, which will help us end this whole horrible business. And FFAC was uh, founded about a decade ago by students at UC Berkeley. And the reason why I am opening up this panel is because so much of our founding, I think, is related to activism and mental health. When I first started to learn about what was going on in the world, uh, especially as it related to the harming of animals, it was a lot for me to deal with. And I took a lot of inspiration from learning about the 10 stages of veganism, which were outlined by Colleen Patrick Goudreau. And I won't go into every single stage right now, but I think a lot of us can relate to learning all this information and just wanting to what she calls evangelize and just share everything we can about what's going on and people not really wanting to be around us. But there's a lot of trauma associated with learning about all this information. And sometimes the way that's expressed can be really disconcerting and not very effective in our communication. It takes time, I think, for people to get the support that they need so they can take on all this information and think strategically about how they communicate so that it's most effective. It's very challenging. I did not know how to talk about eat, eating animals and factory farming when I was a college student, but it's amazing how much uh, our activism has grown over time. And that's really reflected in the work that we do. When we're talking about our staff that are on this call, our interns that are on this call, all of these amazing community members, we really want to support you in your mental health and support the entire community because we believe that it will help us be more effective. This work is not just a job to many of us, it's just a part of like how we live our lives. And with that, there comes a lot of potential stress. There are things like burnout, which can be distinguished from bad days and bad fits if you find that it's persistent over time, if you experience it in more than one situation, 
um, if it's a change from how you used to feel in similar situations. And so when we're talking about these things as a community, we really want to make sure that this work is something that is sustainable. That being said, we are in a different era. I think that a lot of us have noticed today is May 17th, 2020, that factory farming has never been more in the news. And because it's so in the news, I think that a lot of us can feel pressure to talk about this, like this is our moment and there's so much that we need to do. And it's hard. I want to acknowledge that times have changed and this is, this is just such a great webinar to have right now. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. We want to talk about sustainable activism and at the same time, not pretend that we were in some kind of mental health utopia before this entire pandemic and COVID-19 started. That's certainly not true. When I think about this pandemic, um, I recognize that there are three things that sort of might be happening at the very least. Um, the one is the real concern around public health, right? And people dying. The other thing that I notice people talking a lot about and that's impacting them is the recession, right? The financial crisis. And the third is the toll that shelter in place or the pandemic is taking upon our mental health and our ability to be, I guess, to, to, to do our work and just to live our lives. And there's so many ways in which there's messaging around how people should be more productive than ever before. And there's, I think, a tendency to uh, engage in toxic positivity, especially because we are online. That was already a form in which people were exhibiting only like the best uh, forms of themselves. And something that we talk a lot about in our community, especially with the interns, is how do we create space for people to reflect, to feel that they can be honest about what's going on. And as an example, I, I try and say, you know, instead of saying something like, think happy thoughts, you could say something like, things can get really tough and I'm here for you. So that would be an example of not saying something that is just like really positive, but gives people a space to connect with each other. And that's been really important because in order for us to do this work, we want to make it sustainable over the long term. Sometimes self-care is just something that we're told costs a lot of money or time, you know, bubble baths, eating chocolate, <laughs> that kind of thing. And that's not what this is about. Um, in the long term, not everybody can just like be taking bubble baths. I mean, some maybe some people can, but what does self-care really look like is a persistent question that I'm always asking my own self. I don't pretend to be somebody that knows everything, but certainly as the ED of an organization that is just bombarded with really terrible news all the time and just trying to make a difference, I want to be thinking about how can I take care of myself so that we can sustain this movement, sustain this organization. So there are a lot of questions that are probably really feeling relevant to folks right now. What I've been discussing with some other interns is just like, how do I balance being an incredibly compassionate person while also feeling incredibly callous towards the world, right? And feeling a lot of anger. Um, and these, this is like what we really want to create space for. And we want to encourage our community to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. Not that there's anything wrong with not always being the best version of yourself, but if there's anything that we can do to integrate sustainable, and I feel like, you know, sometimes the word sustainable is something that's just used a little bit too freely, but if there's anything that we can do to make sure that we are supporting our community, and that includes food, then I'm all here. I want to talk about that. Somebody once told me that every meal is an opportunity to feel better. And that was very difficult for me to get because I'm like, oh my goodness, I make so many poor choices all the time. But if I do have that idea, then like, how can, how can that benefit me? How can that benefit all of us? So I'm really excited for this webinar and I'll turn it over to our Chicago director, Allie Fairchild. Hi, thank you, Monica. That was a really nice introduction. And 
Um, again, my name is Allie Fairchild. I'm the Chicago Director for FFAC. And I too am so excited for this conversation. I think it's really important um, always, but in some ways now more than ever for us to really be focusing on our emotional well-being and recognizing and understanding the role that food specifically um, might be playing in, in our mood um, and such things that we'll talk about today. Um, I want to take just a second here to actually introduce our, or have our, our two panelists actually introduce themselves. So we have two board members with us today, two of our board members, um, Dr. Verena Rosa, and Dr. Jade Detero. They're both going to just um, give a really brief introduction about kind of why they're here, why they're excited to be part of this conversation. And then we will get right into our questions because we did have a lot of questions come in in advance and we'll also be taking those on the chat or in the Q&A, so feel free to submit those there. Um, so Verena, if you wanna kick things off for us. Sure, thanks so much everyone um, and welcome to our webinar. I'm so excited to see so many people join us today um, to this topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I'm actually, um, I used to practice as a psychiatrist for several years, both with adults but also, uh, also children and youth before I left clinical practice to go back to school to get a degree, um, a research-based degree in public health and Two and a half years of my life I dedicated to studying the relationship between nutrition, dietary choices, and the mental health, um, specifically in young adults. So I hope I can answer most of your questions today. Jade, you're yep. up. All right. Hey everybody, I'm Jade Dotero. I am a physician, family medicine trained from Kelowna, BC. I'm excited to be here today. I have a special interest in plant-based nutrition, uh, lifestyle and preventative medicine, which is um, why this is so wonderful to talk about. I truly believe this is the foundation of medicine and that we can go back to uh, simple lifestyle changes at home in order to lead our optimal lives and that you don't need me as much as you think you do <laughs> and other physicians. So thanks for having me. Yeah. And I would just like to say, I said this on our last webinar that we're really lucky to have um, um, both Verena and Jade with us. I have uh, gotten to know them both well over the last couple of months and they are um, brilliant and uh, have a lot of expertise. So I'm so thankful uh, for you both taking the time to be here with us today. I want to get right into our first question. And um, this is one that maybe a lot of people might have, even if they didn't ask it, because it was kind of all over the news uh, in the last week or so. So here's the question. I recently read in the news that vegetarians are more likely to be depressed and we should eat meat to avoid depression. And this is in reference to a specific study that um, was highlighted by the news. So can you talk about this? Can you comment on this reporting? Yes, I would love to talk about this. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you just so. Um, oh, actually, it just says host disabled participant screen sharing. Anyway, so this was um, a, a headline that first came out in the Daily Mail in the UK, and then it was picked up by several newspapers in North America as well. And um, it referenced a review study that basically means um, uh, researchers took existing studies that are out there in the peer-reviewed literature and they summarized the findings and come to conclusion based on the summary of these findings. Um, and it's interesting because when I did this work in my master's, I actually thought about doing such a review. Um, so I looked at the existing literature and I came to the conclusion that um, the findings that we have on this topic are so poor and so preliminary that it really doesn't warrant um, uh, publishing a systematic review yet because none of these story, uh, none of these existing studies actually came to any conclusions other than that there are associations, right? And associations don't mean causality. So what do I mean by that? For example, if you have- um, Karina. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can, you should be able to share your screen now if you want to, to Yes, perfect. To highlight. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the study that I'm referring to. I've just opened the, the website. Um, eating meat may improve mental health and one in three vegetarians are depressed, a study suggests. Um, and uh, so, so what do I mean by um, association doesn't mean causality. So let's say in a neighborhood, all of a sudden you see a rise in stork nests and storks, right? These birds that supposedly bring babies. <laughs> and in the same neighborhood, all of a sudden you have a rise in babies born. Does that actually mean that the storks bring the babies or do the babies actually come from the humans? Um, but the association is there, right? Both at the same time are there. And this is exactly what is happening in this um, uh, research right now. We often see an association, a high correlation between certain dietary patterns and, um, and some uh, mental health symptoms. And yes, it is true that many of these studies actually found that those who, who said they're vegetarian also um, scored higher on depression or anxiety levels. However, none of that actually says anything about the temporal sequence. And one study actually found that very likely it's the other way around. So you become depressed first. And then for many people in an attempt to um, be more healthy, then they start eating more plant-based. So um, that does not mean that we suggest to eat more meat to improve your mental health. That is a completely false headline. Um, not to mention that when you look at um, the funding of the study, it was actually founded by a lobby organization for the beef industry. So, um, you know, it's questionable um, the how do I put this? The motivation behind publishing this, this um, review is definitely questionable. And I wanted to also show you some work that I um, did. You should see a, a graph um, that shows different levels. And this is also something that is really missing in the discussion of this topic, in the discussion of this um, article. When we look at how diet and mental health are related to each other, we often um, limit our understanding on the biological or biomedical level of this topic, right? So we talk about nutrients and hormones and maybe inflammation and gut bacteria and all of that is obviously very important and very real. But, and this is I think what's specifically important for um, activists as well, there are so many other levels that really influence our dietary choices and our mental health. So our personal level, right? What are our coping strategies, trauma that we might have experienced, um, stress, sleep, physical activity, and so on. And then the interpersonal level is super important. What about support, family support, support of friends, um, conflicts that are going on? That actually, and that's been proven, highly influences our mental health and it highly influences what we eat. Um, and then last but not least, of course, we have a societal and cultural level where things like cultural identity, social norms, um, the environment in which we live, and especially our social determinants of health, so our income, our education level, and so on, have a huge impact on our mental health and diet. So to sum it all up, <laughs> to come to the conclusion that based on very preliminary, preliminary partially very poorly done studies to say that you should eat meat to improve your mental health is simply false. Thanks, Farina. Jade, did you have anything to add? That was a pretty thorough. Um... <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. That was, a, <laughs> that was a slam dunk. I yeah, just, I concur. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So let's um, move to our next question. We had a few questions come in um, uh, asking about the best foods for brain health. Um, some people specifically asked about things like um, having a family history of dementia, foods that you could be um, eating if you wanted to help um, maybe preventatively combat um, brain degeneration. Um, so can you guys speak a little bit to just the best foods for brain health that we could be eating? Sure, I can start. Uh, so two of my favorite physicians when it comes to following along in their research and their knowledge when it comes to brain health are 
Dean and Aisha Shirzai. They also go by Team Shirzai. And I'm going to put a little link in here to a specific article from their website that talks about the top 20 foods for brain health. And you know, these numbers are arbitrary. They could have came up with three, they could have came up with 50. The main thing is when you look at all of the foods that are related to keeping your brain healthy, uh, staving off things like dementia and Alzheimer's, preventing stroke, uh, they're all plant-based, all of them. And uh, so the, the top ones they always refer to when you listen to them in podcasts and look at these articles are beans, greens, berries. Those are some of the biggest ones. Um, they also mention stuff like avocados, which are a healthy fat. Um, and the thing I think is really worth mentioning is that there's a lot of food that you'll, it's more important to avoid. Uh, if you eat a well-balanced plant-based diet, you're going to be feeding your brain lots of great nutrient-dense foods. But what you really want to limit are the things that are laden in saturated fat and cholesterol. And we see this everywhere in marketing and all of the dietary recommendations. Avoid saturated fat, avoid cholesterol. But notice how they never actually say avoid animal products because that's where the majority of saturated fat and cholesterol come from. And that has to do with the lobby group. Skinless, skinless chicken has saturated fat and cholesterol in it. So I really try and tell people the closer you can get in that realm to plant-based foods, the, the better overall for your brain. Um, the other thing I should note, you know, because uh, the comments highlighted, you know, why berries specifically? And you have to think of antioxidants, right? Berries uh, and any other antioxidant-rich food combats any of the free radicals in our body and in particular our brain you're like this cleanup crew that go and get rid of the stuff that can cause damage and that damage can compound over time and lead to diseases like dementia so um if you can you know don't worry about goji berries and other weird berries that you have to get imported in just go for straight up blueberries blackberries strawberries whatever you can access is good enough uh, Verena, do you want to add? Yeah, I ch I'll just add my favorite sentence, uh, which is there's no silver bullet. <laughs> so I know certain individual foods often get hyped like turmeric or um, walnuts. And yes, it's very true. They have very potent um, nutrients that are important for, for our brain health. But if you eat you know, a, a standard American diet, high in saturated fats, animal products, and then add a little bit of turmeric, that's not going to change much, right? It's about the overall composition of your diet. Um, uh, so the more of these foods you can incorporate on a regular daily basis, the better. Don't take it as medicine and, you know, like one tablespoon a day. Just eat it as foods as much as you can. I think that's, that's key. Excellent. Thank you. And, um, Let's see, Jade, it looks like the resource that you shared came, oh, it did go to all panelists and attendees. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody um, was able to see that. Okay, so um, let's move a little bit to talking about um, um, emotional eating. So there were a few questions that came in related to uh, um, what I would say uh, our emotional eating. So things like, is stress eating a real thing? And um, with that, why am I so much more likely to go to junk food rather than healthy food when I feel sad, lonely, bored, et cetera? So those are kind of two questions that are related that are really good questions. Yes, so I think, uh, yes, stress eating is definitely a thing. <laughs> Um, we might all do it in a different way. Some people actually tend to eat less when they're stressed. Others tend to eat more. Um, most people tend to eat, yes, what is, what is generally labeled as comfort foods, um, which we are drawn to for several reasons, right? First of all, they just taste good. They hit exactly the right taste buds. They're usually high in sugar, high in fat. It's all of these things that, you know, throughout evolution it's what we were drawn to because there's high caloric value in these foods and that used to be very important for survival sadly the food industry has kind of taken that to a, a perverted level of providing us with such overflowing these foods and making it seem um 
you know, uh, uh, yummy and tasty and, and that, that uh, environment within which we are that just, you know, lets us know day and day again, like these are the foods that you're going to want to feel better. It's like this instant gratification. It's a cultural and, and societal thing as well. As kids, we get rewarded for something that we did well with sweets and candy, right? So obviously it's linked to a positive thing um, in, our, in our heads. And those are such um, powerful strategies and things that are just ingrained in our brain that it's so hard to uh, get over that. Whereas um, maybe Jake can say a little more about, you know, some actual addictive components in these foods. Um, but yeah, it, all of the like regret that often follows or the actual physical discomfort <laughs> after we eat these foods, we always forget about that. The instant gratification is just right there. Mm -hmm. Such, such good points. Uh, and, and really that marketing piece is, is huge in the cultural thing and the reward center. And so when we have conditioned ourselves to think of junk foods like this as a reward, uh, it totally negates the fact that they're nutritionally devoid and that they're actually terrible for us because all we associate them with is being a treat. And it's gotten to the point where treat is almost a swear because <laughs> it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really line up with whether they're good for you or not. And, and so the thing is, um, you know, our pleasure center in the brain, the nucleus accumbens is activated by certain things, um, drugs, sex, sugar, right? So um, smoking, that's what this whole thing where lots of people who quit smoking end up consuming a lot of sugar and gaining a lot of weight just because they're increasing their calories. But so you think about it, you know, a lot of these uh, foods, because they're high in sugar, can activate our dopamine in our brain. And then it's this direct feedback loop like, woo, I have to get more. Um, so I, I think really the thing is um, when we all slow down and oh boy does this ever take a lot of work but it's worth it and so if we slow down and in those moments where we're like i'm ordering pizza i'm grabbing the ice cream bucket you kind of slow down and think okay why and really peel back those layers and and it, you know it may just me even just mean like distracting yourself for a minute but you start to uncover is it really the ice cream that i want or what else is going to help um, the other thing is you know it takes work but breaking these patterns of association um, starting to fill other things in as a treat like i'm going to meditate for 5 minutes man is that ever a treat to just like calm my brain down and not talk to anybody or i'm going to go for a walk for 5 minutes and breathe fresh air so it's it's um it's like i mean we could go on and on about this but the bottom line is it is a real thing and once you, once you're conscious of it that's when you can really start to unpack like how can i how can i change these triggers such good points and i always like to throw in when i can so i'm going to do it here reminding everyone to be kind to yourself so so understanding that we're all doing or trying to do the best we can um, with things like this so um, if you happen to not make the best decision um, with regard to, you know, something that you go to for food, um, just be kind to yourself and compassionate towards yourself and move on and make your next decision be a better one. So um, just reminding uh, everyone to be kind to ourselves. So easy to not be kind to ourselves. Yeah. Um, so can well I, said. Can I add something um, just yeah. really quickly? Um, you know, and even if it's something you just have to have that cookie or you just, you know, like that's just something where you, you can't resist um, and you're just drawn to those comfort foods. There's a, there's a really cool um, emerging research that shows, and I, I said that during our last webinar too, that a lot of these health behaviors are actually clustering together. So if you're, you know, you're more likely or it's easier for you to, let's say, increase your physical activity or, um, you know, put higher, put your sleep at a higher priority. Those things are linked. Like the more you move physically, the better you sleep, the more you crave healthy foods. It's actually quite interesting. So maybe you just need to like work on a tiny little piece of the puzzle and the other pieces start to fall in place over time. And yes, definitely be kind and patient with yourself. Absolutely. Such important points. Um, Okay, the next question that I want to move to is um, someone asking about caffeine. So there was a question 
um, about whether or not caffeine can have an impact on your mood? And if so, like, how does that work? Or is that something we should be concerned about? Maybe does it affect everyone differently? So anything that you want to speak to related to caffeine? Well, um, I can't tell you the specifics in terms of the chemical process, but whenever you look up, you know, foods good or bad for mental health, caffeine is often listed um, among the bad uh, foods and substances. Um, and it, I think it's really a question of moderation or amount, right? And we all know this when we have that one nice cup of coffee in the morning, that can really boost your mood. And I would say if that's what you feel, then go for it. But if you drink four or five cups of coffee during the day and that increases your anxiety level and you start getting, you know, heart flatters, and it's like, then it's not good for you anymore, obviously. And I think that's also kind of what is what is shown in the research. Yeah, you definitely hit that point that I wanted to to really emphasize. And it's just that, you know, for a lot of people, they associate, I, you know, if they have anxiety or feel anxious, then it causes these physical manifestations, right? Then it causes the sweating, the flushing, the racing heart, the palpitations, I can't really breathe. But the thing is, that can work the other way too. And so if you start to get physical symptoms and you're somebody who's prone to be anxious or you're in an anxiety provoking situation, uh, then having too much caffeine can actually trigger those feelings. And so the, the mental physical works circular. And so if lots of hand actions to give you the visual, but really, um, you know, that's one thing I do counsel patients on. And I say, listen, like pay attention to what caffeine does to your body. If it's something that you find really starts to ramp your heart rate up and you don't feel good and you're jittery. And, you know, I've had people say that instead of feel uh, refreshed, they just feel warm and like they're vibrating. I go, okay, then it's, it's, you know, dial it back, try and find your limit. And if it's none, then you really like a warm beverage switch over to tea there can be great teas with high antioxidants and minimal caffeine so um yeah that's great and i think i'll just add or just say one thing related to the the topic of coffee that i often um have conversations with people about and that is that there's a difference between having a cup of um maybe um black coffee than having a cup of coffee where you are dumping like four packs of sugar and creamer, especially if it's dairy, um, uh, you know, cow milk creamer. Um, and so there's a lot of um, factors that go into what that cup of coffee looks like. So just um, be mindful of that if you are a coffee drinker. Um, okay, we're getting actually closer to the end of our list of um, pre-submitted questions. So I want to remind everyone, if you do have a question that you want to ask, feel free to add that in the Q&A or the chat. Um, okay, this is a really important question, and it's actually something that we talked about a little bit on the last webinar, and that is um, our gut health. So, you know, we all, I think, are familiar, because it's been just so widely reported on lately, how important our gut health is. And um, people are starting to become really aware of the connection between our gut health and our brain health. And so there was a question on um, if you could just speak about that connection between gut health and brain health and anything that you would like to share for people to know about that. Where do we start? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the gut brain connection, frankly, is everything. If we could pick one area of medicine that has like the it's all the buzzwords the most emerging evidence it's going to hit the news this is it especially in the realm of the microbiome you know we have no idea we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg really on how many organisms live on us like more than human cells and they all work in this beautiful symbiotic relationship i just imagine our whole microbiome on our body having like kumbaya and just they we all work together and so the thing that i want to highlight before verena says anything is just this point 
um, the vast majority of our serotonin is made in our gut. Most people associate serotonin with our brain. And we all know serotonin is one of those feel-good chemicals. It's emphasized in all of the drugs related to anxiety and depression. You got to boost your serotonin. I mean, there's also dopamine and norepinephrine. But if you think about it, if serotonin is developed in your gut, you really want your digestion to be working well. If it's not functioning well, you're not going to get that serotonin you need. And so... Um, part of that is feeding your gut microbiome and allowing it to flourish and be healthy and going into the whole subject of prebiotics, postbiotics, probiotics, it could take like a day and a half. Nobody has time for that. But what I will say is this, if you can look up one physician and the information that he has on gut health, it would be Dr. Will Balsowitz. And I'm going to put a link to him. You can find him on Instagram, YouTube, you name it, Google him. He's going to be um, coming up at the talk, top of the Google ticker right now just because he came out with a book called Fiber Fueled. It's already become an instant bestseller and it really talks in detail, super nerdy, amazing detail with a lot of good points about how to improve your gut health, which ultimately improves your mental well being. Yeah, I'll just add, um, we're all, you know, due to what we're um, exposed to um, in our mother's body and, and through birth and as um, infants and so on, we kind of build up this, this microbiome. So the composition of all the bugs in our, in our intestinal tract. Um, and, and some people will say, well, and then we're just stuck with that. And that's actually shown to be only true to a certain extent. You can actually highly influence your microbiome through your diet. Um, and one very, very important food for our microbiome is fiber, right? I mean, we, we hear this a lot. Um, fiber is important to you. And then there's, there's people, well, why is fiber important? We can't even digest it. We just poop it out. And it's true, but it is the most important thing for the bugs that live in our intestine. And I recently read a study that actually showed that 97% of Americans are deficient in fiber. So pretty much everyone. Um, and I, I just thought that's crazy. It's such an important food for, for um, our microbiome that really um, steers our health and well-being and we just don't eat enough of it. Crazy. And Verena, do you mm -hmm. want to um, just remind people where, what type of foods we get fiber from and what type of foods we do not get fiber from? Yes. Um, well, I think you can probably take a guess. <laughs> Green leafy vegetables, whole grains, um, fruit, you know, all of these whole foods um, are really high in fiber. Um, I think it's actually 70% of Americans don't even meet the minimum requirement of servings um, in terms of vegetables and fruit. For the U.S. American population, they actually approved um, fried potatoes, i.e. fries, as a vegetable because otherwise pretty much no one in the U.S. would meet the requirement. Um, so, you know, all of these foods that are good for you but that we don't eat enough of, those are high in fiber. Maybe Jade wants to expand a little more on that. Oh boy. <laughs> um, first of all, please don't include fries in your intake and if if they're baked maybe but just I mean I know it's like it's funny the things we do to justify our behaviors but um, fries actually have a link with breast cancer so I tell people please don't go there. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, just for the sake of time, I see there's been a few questions popping in the Q and A, but if we wanted to have a specific webinar about fiber and gut health, I'm sure we could go off on that tangent. Maybe I'd pull some strings and see if Will would even talk with us. So. Yeah. Like there's so many things that we talked about both last time and this time that could be their whole own webinar. So that sounds good. And I think that with that, I also just wanted to highlight that you are not getting fiber from um, animal products. Just to throw that out there um, for people as a reminder that you really need to be eating um, whole plant food to be getting that fiber. Ooh, uh, which triggered a reminder for me. One thing I yeah. can say, because people are always like, well, should I just take probiotics then to help my gut microbiome? No, do not take them. Uh, me saying that 
probably sounds controversial and I am going against many other physicians that I know, but when you are giving um, this living organism, which is your gut, that's full of thousands, if not millions of different types of organisms, one strain of lactobacillus, you are doing a monoculture. It's like a monocrop with farming, which I think we can all relate is not ideal um, breeding grounds and it does not create a healthy gut microbiome and for people after antibiotics who take probiotics they actually can have a negative impact from that probiotic so um Yes, fruit has a lots of fiber. Somebody just asked that. Please, like any fruit, vegetable, whole grain, beans, legumes, knock your socks off. Those are going to really give you the most bang for your buck. And if people are wondering about feeding their gut microbiome as well, instead of probiotics, things like kimchi, cabbage, those fermented foods, um, sorry, not cabbage, sauerkraut, uh, one of my faves, but those are, those are really going to help in feeding the gut microbiome and the fiber is as well just had to, yeah. very important. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna go to some of the questions that have come in and there has been, um, there have been two questions asked related to sleep. So let's talk about these. Um, I'm gonna just ask them both and then Verena, I'll let you start. So the first one is, should you stop eating at a certain time before bed? Um, so maybe some advice on when to maybe have your last meal um, prior to going to bed and then, um, is there any truth to a lack of vitamin D impacting sleep? Is D3 a good supplement? Okay, so there's a lot to, to say there. So, Brina, I'll let you start, and then Jade will come to you. Yeah, so um, sleep is crucial uh, when we talk about our mental health, right? It's often one of the first things that goes out the window when we start developing mental health symptoms, or the other way around, sleep actually triggers de the development of of depressive or anxiety symptoms or even up to psychotic symptoms so it's extremely important for our brain health and with all of these um, it's called sleep hygiene recommendations we can say that that is based on you know an average population and my number one recommendation is always um, what works for you right but in general we can say um, the recommendations are don't eat anything an hour to two hours before you go to bed. Um, if you eat closer to your bedtime, try to eat things that are more easily digested. Stay away from dairy products. Um, stay away from heavy, greasy, um, sugary uh, foods right before you go to bed. Um, that should help you go, get through the night better. I, I know of some people who, um, worry about waking up in the night because they get hungry and they um, have made good experience with eating something hearty, um, complex carbs at night, maybe oatmeal or something that you would eat for breakfast otherwise, and that helps them um, sleep through the night uh, better. So those are just some some thoughts that I that I have and that I've talked to people about. Um, a couple things to definitely add to that is uh, I see heartburn all the time as a generalist family medicine. And a lot of that has to do with gravity. And so if you eat too close to bed, um, even if you eat too close to TV time and then you're lounging back on your couch, think about it. Suddenly you're not upright anymore. And it's very easy for the uh, acidic contents of your stomach to come up your esophagus when you're horizontal instead of when you're upright. And so um, to avoid proton pump inhibitors, which are one of the most commonly used medications uh, and really have a lot of negative side effects, I really encourage people to try and give a gap. And yeah, Verena, you're right, like one to two hours, I even say three. Um, and proton pump inhibitors aren't ideal because they do actually reduce your stomach acid, which can be protective in a way. And they also have been shown in... Um, my studies or rat studies to be linked to a stomach cancer, which doesn't always translate to um, humans. And that's why I could go on a tangent about animal studies. But, um, and the other thing is it's linked with osteoporosis and C. diff infections, which are absolutely terrible. So I tell people to avoid heartburn, really don't eat close to dinner. The other thing too, is there has been some good evidence about intermittent fasting, and that can be done on a daily basis, just for overall, um, you know, weight loss, but also, 
when you're sleeping, your body doesn't want to expend all its energy trying to digest your food. It wants to do all of that cleanup. You know how I was talking about earlier about things like antioxidants to the brain, cleaning up free radicals? Your body's busy enough doing all of that. It doesn't need to be worrying about the food that's going through your digestion. So you kind of got to let your body do its thing. And so with intermittent fasting, you don't have to get too wild about it. You can simply stop eating at 7 p.m. and then eat your breakfast at 7 a.m. in a 12-hour window, which seems pretty normal, is intermittent fasting fasting. So that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, I always, you know, really encourage people when they wake up in the night and they feel hunger, you're right, Verena, like a complex carb thing is a really great snack. The other thing I always say is like, are you thirsty? And is there another reason that you're awake? Is your mind racing about something? Would journaling help? A couple deep breaths, this too shall pass. Is it true hunger? For some people who are used to eating really high fat and high sugar foods, it's not so much actually the um, hunger that they're experiencing, but a bit of withdrawal from, from the foods that can potentially have that dopamine surging property. So um, your brain can be tricky and it's just learning to recognize that a bit. As for the whole thing with vitamin D impacting sleep, vitamin D is one of those wonderful nutrients that just impacts health overall. And because those of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere are actually mostly depleted, I tell everybody uh, vitamin D, yeah, D3 supplement. In the winter months, 2,000 units a day, and in the summer, 1,000, unless you can get outside for 15 to 20 minutes of getting sun all on your upper body. Rina, is there anything you'd like to add about vitamin Yeah, I'd just like to say, like, that, that is, it's true that is research that is emerging, but again, it's still very much at the association level. So we, if there's a true association, meaning that those two things really are connected, we don't really understand yet why or how. Um, but yeah, I fully agree with Jade since it's something that we, sh you know, should probably be taking anyways. Why not, right? It's, it's definitely not bad for sleep. That's great, thank you. I'll just add to um, with regard to supplementing, um, well, really in any way, I just wanted to do another public service announcement for those um, individuals on the call who are trying to um, minimize as much as possible or avoid animal products altogether. Um, you do have to look for a vegan version of things like this. So most just general um, uh, pills that you would be taking are in a gelatin capsule, which um, is not um, plant-based or vegan. So just throwing that out there for everyone. Um, okay, let's move to another question that came in and this is back to caffeine. So the question is, is there any evidence to suggest that caffeine inhibits nutrient absorption? So um, this is a good question because there is a lot of conversation about there, um, even if we're just talking about uh, coffee. You know, if you're gonna have a cup of coffee, should you have it? one to two hours before eating a meal because of it um, inhibiting nutrient absorption. Um, so any comments on that? The long and short of it is, I always recommend that people have it separate from their meals. Um, reason being is there is robust evidence to show that it can block absorption of iron and iron is uh, a nutrient that people are commonly deficient in regardless of whether they're an omnivore or plant-based or anywhere in between and so just for that nutrient alone i always say you know try try and get the coffee and tea and it's actually not necessarily the caffeine you know right i think it can be other components but i just from a coffee perspective i say okay stay away from iron so if you have oatmeal in the morning which i highly recommend to everybody uh just you know do citrus with it and avoid coffee um there is a, you know i don't have a concrete answer about caffeine and nutrient depletion i've seen enough evidence to support it um would I recommend that people avoid it completely because of it? No, I think that caffeine can also have some uh, good benefits. And we talk about things that can sometimes benefit mood and mental clarity. But um, again, it's just lower levels better. Verena, what about you? Yeah, honestly, I just know um, caffeine and iron, not a good mix. <laughs> yeah, that's it. One other thing I'd like to say too, with regard to, to coffee, um, I do not want to open up a conversation about organic versus non-organic, but just as another you know public service announcement to people, because um, because many people are unaware, coffee and tea are some of the most heavily sprayed um, products that we consume. Um, so 
if there is you know, a few things that you are able to eat or purchase organic, um, coffee and tea, especially if you're doing green tea, um, try to, to make that purchase be organic if you can, um, just because they are so heavily sprayed. So you really would be ingesting a lot of um, uh, toxins that you most likely do not want to be ingesting if you're doing non-organic. I don't know if either of you want to say anything about that because again, I don't want to open up a big organic um, conversation, but there are a few things that we really should be mindful of with how heavily sprayed they are and coffee and tea are, is definitely um, one of those areas. Well, actually, like Ali, you raise a really good point because the the reason being is, I mean, yeah, we could get into the, the ethical implications of it and whatnot and, and agricultural, but here's the bottom line. If we're going to, if we're going to make it salient and drive the point home about gut health and mental well being, our gut is dependent on us having a good environment in there. And it's actually um, proven that pesticides, especially glyphosate, which is in Roundup can affect that one cell wall thick barrier in in our digestive lining and so uh, yeah you're right um that's one of those things where it's like how much is your health worth you know the extra couple bucks that it is for organic is so worth it if it means that you're going to have good digestion because look at that ripple effect not only will you feel better but you will also benefit with better mental well-being so yeah i'm totally with you and if people are like i'm overwhelmed by what to choose for organic just google the dirty dozen and those are the ones that you really if you could just do, um you know buy organic stuff that you mostly would eat the the peel of or the outside so like tomatoes and blueberries and zucchini and whatnot so dirty dozen find that list and you're right coffee tea yeah absolutely um okay so uh one more question that i want to get to it which is um uh, the question is what foods can help trim belly fat and i'm wondering um uh Verena, you had wanted to mention um a little bit about the mediterranean diet so maybe mm -hmm. as part of this you could kind of tile that mm -hmm. in if you'd like um well, it's two different things. I think with regards to the first question, what foods help trim the belly fat? Unfortunately, all of this kind of research or idea, both with foods and physical exercise, by the way, that we can um, target uh, certain fat deposits on specific parts of our body with specific foods or specific exercises has been debunked. Um, it's an overall question of, you know, um, fat um, uh, proportion of your body and and really kind of like your genetic disposition of where you store that fat in your body. So my answer is I don't know of any foods that would help trim the belly fat specifically. I think that's it would be so great and if it was pineapple even better because that's my favorite fruit but I don't think it's um, realistic unfortunately. Um, I wanted to maybe finish off our discussion with mentioning the Mediterranean diet, because I imagine some of you might um, leave this webinar and then start some Googling, you know, what foods are good for mental health, and you will come across um, almost certainly the Mediterranean diet. Um, and just like uh, the first article that we started out with about, you know, should you eat meat to improve your mental health? The question isn't what you call your diet. The question is, what do you actually eat? And many people imagine the Mediterranean diet means a bottle of wine per day, a bottle of olive oil in my fried vegetable, and spaghetti carbonara with bacon and cream sauce for dinner. That's all Italian, right? So it's the Mediterranean diet. It is not. The Mediterranean diet is first and foremost vegetables and fruit. Almost 90% of what you would eat under a classic Mediterranean diet is um, vegetable and fruit. So those are really the, the number one things that will uh, not just benefit your mental health, but your health overall. Um, if you're so inclined and you would like to have a glass of wine every now and then, um, or do your cooking with a little bit of olive oil, it's allowed. <laughs> um, but it's certainly not the components that make this diet or this dietary pattern healthy. And the same goes for, um, and it's actually one of the main flaws in the studies that we talked about um, at the beginning, just because someone says they're vegetarian or vegan, that does not mean you know what they actually eat. 
right? And a lot of these studies, that's all they did. They asked someone, are you vegetarian or vegan? Yes or no. And then measured their depression and then looked if there's an association. They never asked what people actually ate specifically. So if I ate chips and drank Coke all day, I'm technically vegan. It doesn't mean that I have a healthy diet. Um, so be very mindful of all these terms that are flying around, um, including Mediterranean diet, um, and, and really think about the specific components and the composition of your diet. You don't need to label it. Just eat fruits, vegetable, whole grains. Don't be afraid of carbs, um, oils in moderation, and you're good to go. Excellent. Jay, do you want to add anything yeah. about the the drop belly fat or even just, I don't know if you want to speak to any foods that would be, or, or what you should be consuming most of if you're uh, maybe trying to lose weight, if that maybe is the heart of that question. Sure. Yeah. And so <laughs> not a webinar goes by that I don't talk about nutritionfacts.org. Come on. So those who know me know I love Dr. Michael Greger. Why? Because his website is nonprofit. That's my daughter, in case you're wondering. And, uh, and what he does is he looks at all of the research, all the stuff that's industry funded, all the stuff that's big kale, you know. And so he comes up with all of these um, points from the data. And so there's an article that I just quickly looked up on there to see, well, what's Dr. Greger saying? So uh, first of all, it made me realize there is a wonderful app that he has for those who don't have it, download the Daily Dozen. So I talked about the Dirty Dozen, don't be confused with that. The Dirty Dozen are the foods you wanna avoid um, the regular and buy organic, but the Daily Dozen is actually what he recommends in order to hit all of your nutrient targets especially if you're looking at whole food plant-based, but just in general. But on the Daily Dozen, he also has a section called 21 Tweaks. And this comes from his book, How Not to Diet. And one of the things you can do, actually, if you're looking to do things like reduce fat overall, which will then trickle down and reduce belly fat, is to drink a full glass of water before every meal. There's one quick thing. Another quick tip, he says, is to eat something either like an apple or a small garden salad with just vinegar on it, like balsamic or red wine, no oil, and just a lot of veggies. And if you do those as preloads during your, like before meals, it can actually um, cause a calorie deficit and you can lose weight. When they looked at other things that you could eat that may actually reduce abdominal fat, soy was one of them. Uh, turmeric, oh, we always talk about turmeric being so wonderful. Sure, sprinkle it on your food, don't obsess about it. And then the other thing is grapefruit, which that's probably why all of those ridiculous grapefruit diets have come about. Um, and conversely, one of the things that they've shown may actually increase adiposity, and in particular, the type of adiposity that we can hold on our abdomen is milk. Um, and the other thing to note is that uh, there's been pretty ample evidence. You know, we always give red meat like a really bad rap. A chicken has actually been shown in certain studies to increase the number and size of fat cells. Um, so the one of the, I mean, it's complicated, but one of the things that tends to be, um, you know, a concern is, is just, yeah, chicken. So I tell people really, really try and avoid that. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as it goes with evidence, the closer you get to whole food plant-based, um, the better your odds of having a normalized BMI without having to calorie count and with eating good, healthy, large portions of nutrient-dense, low-calorie food. Great. Thank you. So I'm mindful of the time that we have about one minute left. I did see, um, Carla, I don't know if you're still here. I saw that you had your hand raised. I messaged you in the chat if you want to let you know or let us know what your question is. Um, Chris, are there any other questions that we missed? Anything that we could try to squeeze in here? Yeah, I think there were two other questions that popped into the Q&A, um, or maybe a few. I don't know if you can pull that up really quick. I don't know okay. if we're going to get it to it right now, or you might be able to follow up after. Um, the first one, I don't, I don't think we addressed this one. I've heard different things about the impact of drinking water while eating. Could you talk about that? Mm. 
I and I, I briefly mentioned, you know, that if you have a glass of water before your meal, there has been some evidence that that may cause you to consume less calories. For some people who get uh, digestive issues, they may not want to drink a ton of water with their meal just in order to aid with digestion. But I tell most people, don't overthink it. Water's great. Have it whenever. Great. Um, I see a, we can probably answer this one quick too. Um, the, any supplements you would recommend aside from the obvious B12 with which we should all be supplementing, um, honestly, whether or not we eat plant-based. Um, so the question is, I've heard supplements can be useless as many of the vitamins go right through you. So what's your thought on that? Briefly, if possible. Jade, go for it. Okay. I'm typing it as I <laughs> go. B12, vitamin D, and an algae-based omega-3. That's it. Uh, you, there's two other nutrients we should be conscious of, and it's iodine. So you can just get iodized salt, or you can get a little iodine dropper and just put it in water and drink your water, and that's it for the day. And the other thing is zinc, and just a little sprinkle of pumpkin seeds on your salad will cover that. So I am not a fan of multivitamins unless absolutely necessary. If you just eat a diverse uh, portfolio in your diet, then boom, these are enough to cover it. So I'll just put a little blurb in, in the chat. That's great. And I think we can really quick just get through our last two questions here because they're pretty simple um, before everybody signs off. Um, one is what about added oil? So Verena kind of already did mention, um, generally speaking, using as little oil as possible um, when we're cooking. Verena, did you wanna say anything more about oil or um, adding sugar like when we're baking? I would say in general, olive oil is a good bet unless you cook at very high temperature, then avocado oil is a safer option. Um, added sugar in baking, if you can add whole dates or bananas to sweeten your baking because that way you have the sweetness and the fiber and all of the other nutrients um, and try to stay away from sugar as much as you can. There's really ample evidence that it's not just bad for your physical but also for your mental health. Okay, great. And then last question before everyone heads out um, is apple cider vinegar. So um, I see the question is about, this is you know really popular right now online with regard to weight loss, um, thoughts on consuming apple cider vinegar, maybe like in the morning when you first wake up, any thoughts on that? I do have thoughts on that. Um, there's a st or several studies that showed an association again between people who had, I think, uh, three tablespoons a day of apple cider vinegar, drinking that, um, and then weight loss. Um, we don't know if that's true for everyone. This is population-based, so on average. Um, and also, we don't know if that's true and if so, how and why. Uh, you can imagine, though, if you drink apple cider vinegar in the morning, and I've tried it myself, that your appetite goes down pretty quickly because it just tastes um, like vinegar. So if, if you think that helps, you know, try it. It's certainly not bad for you. Um, but it, again, there is no silver bullet, unfortunately. And do make sure you dilute it in water just for the sake of your, your teeth. Um, uh, okay, great. So um, we're going to, I think, call it there. I want to um, just let everyone know because I see a question about this um, uh, asking if the recording will be available and how you'll get that. So um, that, yes, it's available to you and that will be sent out to you um, via email, um, I think sometime this week. Uh, so look forward to that. Feel free to share that with anyone who maybe wasn't able to join us today. And um, I'll also mention that you can check out FFAC, um, FFAC's website or the events tab on the website to see um, more upcoming events that we have. I think this week in particular, we have two meet and greets with two of our directors. So check that out if you're interested and stay tuned just via social media um, uh, for other you know, announcements of upcoming events and things like that. Thank you guys all so much for being here today. I think we were able to pack in a lot of information in the short time that we had. Of course, there's so much more um, uh, to always say about everything. So maybe we'll continue these conversations. Um, but thank you to everyone. And I see that Monica was just asking if um, all of the interns that are on the call could stay on for us to talk. So um, if you're an intern, try to stay on here for a minute. Um, otherwise, uh, everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you uh, on our next webinar or at our next event. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>